introduced myself earlier for the sake of the, the tape and video, so I, I, I'll just do a little bit of that right now. Um, my name is Max Parthas. I am a spoken word poet and an abolitionist, slavery abolitionist. I am the founder or co-founder of Prismatic Dreams and also the Paul Cuffey Abolitionist Center in Sumter, South Carolina. For the past uh, couple decades, my main focus has been the study of modern day slavery as it is practiced through the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. I don't think anybody on this planet has dug into it more than I have. And you have in your hands right now some of the results of that. The, I, I traced the history of this thing, this 13th Amendment. It didn't just pop up out of nowhere. Somebody had to uh, manifest this, to come up with this idea. Why did they come up with this idea of an exception clause? Was it the first time? Did, did it work somewhere else? And I found out that it goes all the way back to 1777, to Vermont. Uh, and you can pick up that single paper right there and you can see it for yourself. I'd like to get something on video if we can get some, if you guys would be willing to volunteer. <coughs> if I can get each of you to read one of these things, there's only like, what is it, six of them, right? There's like six of them. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you be willing to read one of them on tape? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, let me just pop this camera open right here. And uh, we'll start from left to left, right? And uh, if you just say your name. And then read that. So where there's a number one, you read that. Right. Two. Exactly. So let's start with Malefi. <coughs> Malefi Ascari. Number one, 1777, Constitution of the State of Vermont. <coughs> Chapter one, a declaration of the rights of the inhabitants of the State of Vermont. Article first, all persons born free, their natural rights, slavery prohibited. That all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights amongst which the enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possession, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Therefore, no person born in this country or brought from, over, or brought from overseas ought to be holding by law to serve any person as a servant slave or princess after arriving to the age of 21 years, unless bound by that person's own consent after arriving to such age or bound by law for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. Or the like. All right. Uh, Moody. Number two, 1787 Northwest Ordinance, Article 6. There should be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory. Otherwise, then the punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, provided always that any person escape into the same from whom labor or service is lawfully claimed in any one of the original states, such fugitive may be lawfully reclaimed and conveyed to the person claiming his or her labor or service as before said. Wow. Wow. Thank you. All right. Uh, just names. Number three, 1806, Ohio State Constitution, Section 2. There shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in this state otherwise than for the punishment of crimes, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, nor shall any male person arrived at the age of 21 years or female person arrived at the age of 18 years be held to serve any person as a servant under the pretense of indenture or otherwise, unless such person shall enter into such indenture while in a state of perfect freedom and on a, con and on a condition of a bona fide consideration received <coughs> or to be received for their service except as before accepted nor shall any indenture of any Negro or mulatto hereafter made and executed out of the state, <coughs> or if made in the state, for the term of service exceeds one year, be of the least validity, except those given in the case of apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, the next one, please. Um, Lisa Mandel. Uh, 18... 
61, March 2, Corwin Amendment, supported by Lincoln. No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. Wow. Impossible to abolish by Congress. And uh, would you be willing? Camille Schaeffer, number five, okay. 1861, Alabama State Constitution, section 32. Slavery prohibited, involuntary servitude. That no form to, of slavery shall exist in this state. And there shall not be any involuntary servitude. Otherwise, than for the punishment of crime, of which the party should have been duly convicted. And uh, thank you. The last one, of course, is the one we have today, which is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, <clears throat> whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now, you see, there are things in common here. You can see, like, certain patterns have occurred. Every time the exception clause was spoken of, there was something that was associated with it all the way up until Alabama. And we know Alabama uh, uh, was based on racist conditions. But what was the, the common denominator? They kept pointing to who? Negroes and mulattoes and people in bondage and people in... That's what it was made for from the very beginning in 1777 and then used for all the way up to 1865. Uh, they had two extremes in here. One was the Corwin Amendment, which uh, Lisa read, which basically said <coughs> Congress could never abolish slavery in this country. To put it into that position where no one could ever stop slavery. So that was one extreme. And the other extreme was, uh, it looks like, you know, Ohio State's Constitution is extremely convoluted. Like, oh my God, there's so much going on here. But at the same time, you see the names that keep popping up about who it is in reference to. I mean, you could try to confuse everybody on earth, but you're definitely saying Negroes and mulattoes right there. So that means that this is who it's aimed at, Negro and Mulattoes. And this was a plan that came together in Lincoln's mind from an Ohio senator whose name I can't at this moment remember, but I do remember that he was an abolitionist. And he had been familiar with the circumstances in these other documents throughout the history of the last century or so and proposed to Lincoln th that they use it. Lincoln presented it to Congress. Congress said, okay, and this became the law of the land. Uh, the problem is that loophole was left there. And that loophole was left there for a specific reason. The reason was to transfer how slavery was run from the very beginning. They knew that slavery was going to end. I mean, it was heading towards a war, and eventually a war did happen. Uh, so there had to be some kind of way to keep this institution going, but with the approval of the people. Because the only reason slavery was ending is because people were getting sick of the human rights violations to a degree that the whole world was really ready to rise up against the United States. They had already gotten rid of the transatlantic slave trade. But that was abolished, so America was one of the standouts and the holdouts, you know. Uh, in any case, the, guy, the name of the guy was William Seward. William Seward, that's who it was. Thank you very much. You got your back, bro. I uh, appreciate that, brother. Yeah, so he, he proposed that Lincoln uh, adopt this language. And Lincoln uh, had a colleague by the name of Justice Stevens, uh, Alexander Stevens, I think his name was. And they were in constant communication. Uh, Stevens was a pro uh, supporter of slavery, while Lincoln was a supporter of something else, the Corwin Amendment, for instance. Lincoln, for those that may not know either here or on tape later on, Lincoln was a known racist white supremacist and has attested to that fact in his very own words on many occasions, even going to the point where saying, you know, if I had to choose between ending slavery and uh, 
keeping the union together. I go with yeah. <laughs> keeping the union yeah. together, not clear being a that. single slave. You know what I mean? You know, he's the most celebrated president amongst the black community. Like they love him and, and JFK. They love him. We we have been so bamboozled, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. we don't understand the other side to right. that. To Lincoln, free the slaves, a whole other side of it. It was a, it was political and it mm -hmm. was military move. Yeah. And even towards the end, the South was in, uh, well, the North was in jeopardy of losing, and, and and then they finally agreed to allow black men, formerly enslaved black men, and even women who worked as nurses, to join the, the, the forces and fight. So we ended up with I think it was like two hundred thousand black soldiers who excelled at uh, what they were doing to try to gain their freedom. Little did they know that they were being hustled from the start. As I said, one of Lincoln's uh, <coughs> companions that he worked with often was Justice Stevens, and he wrote a letter to him in 18, I think it's 59, 1859, I believe it, I think it was, I may be wrong, 1859 to 1862, probably 59. In any case, he said to Justice Stevens, first of all, he assured him that they should have no worry about the North trying to take away slavery. And then, he said, the only difference between us, if you want to do another Google on that, Justice Stevens, letter to, uh, Lincoln's letter <coughs> to Justice Stevens. Okay. Yes. And he said, the only difference between the North and the South is that you in the South think that slavery should be legal and entitled to all. And we in the North think that it should be restricted. Now you have to wonder, what does he mean by restricted? And that's where the study of these exception clauses came into place, as well as the people who were surrounding and counseling Lincoln. He was talking about a system that was already in play. It was already in play in Vermont, it was already in play in Alabama, it was already in play in Ohio, and it was a system called convict leasing. Convict leasing he saw as a more humane version of slavery where now the state takes control. So you just can't have everybody owning slaves. And uh, if you read the book titled wow. One Dies, Get Another by J. Mancini, uh, Convict Leasing in the American South, 18, uh, 19, 1865 to 1928, I believe that's the whole title. If you read that, you'll see the reasons why. Is because during the period of chattel slavery, there was some concern about the health and welfare of what you thought is your property, just like a horse breeder would have health and welfare concerns about their livestock or their prized animals. Well, that's how it was then. So, it, 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 you know, it would cost them something to keep them alive. But with convict leasing, one dies, get another. If you, if, if, for instance, you had a contract with the mining company in Texas, and uh, that contract required you needed 30 more miners. The uh, mining company, or, which was being run out by the prisons, would call up uh, the constables and say, we need 30 men. They would go out and arrest people for vagrancy charges, for pig laws, whatever it is they needed to do, and then bring them back in to where they would be literally worked to death. They, I believe it was like 7 out of 10 never survived the process, particularly in the mines. If you've never seen the film One Dies, or not One Dies, good. if you've never seen the film Slavery by Another Name, you can see it for free on PBS. It's one of three films I highly suggest that everybody watch in order to get a better perspective of the type of crime against humanity we're dealing with here that is literally invisible to the masses. What is it called? Again? It's called Slavery by Another Name, <laughs> and it's free on PBS. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want, I'll give you all three titles right now, since you want to put them down, and if anybody want to make notes of them. Uh, there's a lot of films that have been coming out of late, but these three really break down the past, present, and the future. you can look up, even if you find them unbelievable, you can see them. If I was to say to you that we have modern day slave auctions, I mean that 100%. We have modern day slave auctions right now. There's a 45 second video that was uh, put out by uh, Brave New World and it's called Immigrants for Sale. And in this video, someone snuck into a prison auction where they were selling this prison, a uh, private prison. 
So there was two auctioneers and maybe a dozen men in black, <laughs> if you feel me, you know, people with money to burn. And the auctioneer gets up there and explains in no uncertain terms that this prison, <clears throat> no matter what it is, your product that you're trying to make, whatever services you're providing, there will be a steady supply of people in this prison to fill your needs. He was selling the idea that the prison will always be filled. Whatever it is you're making, whatever it is you're selling, so you can exploit their labor. And then they started the bidding at five million, and it went on. It, it, it's an amazing thing to see. It's a literal slave auction. The detention center that I'm going to sell today really is state of the art. It's as good as it can possibly get. You have the people coming into that pipeline, so you have an endless supply of product. No matter what your business is, what you're looking for, we will have a steady supply of people in America to fill this facility. Five million, you want to bid five million, five. I have five million dollars, you want to bid five million, five. Five million, you want to bid five million, five. Yes, sir, thank you. Got five million, a hundred. Now give me five million, two hundred. And In the digital world, we don't need bodies to be there anymore. You know what I mean? All we got to do is we can do it online. Right now, a child in China can go online and purchase stocks in for-profit private prisons or in jail bonds here in the United States. And guess what it is they own? They don't own part of a freaking jail. They own the promise that the jail will always be filled with people, meaning you own people now. You're a slave owner just by owning stocks in for-profit prisons. One of the victories we've had in the past couple of years is di divestment programs. Divestment programs I've witnessed have cost the for-profit private industry as much as $14 billion and put their entire existence in jeopardy. They were almost destroyed in a single day. If you guys remember a few years back when uh, the Obama administration announced that they would no longer be seeking to renew for-profit private prison contracts. That very day, the stocks of the major companies like G. Uh, G4S, uh, the GEO Group, and CCA, now known as Core Civic, they all just tanked straight down. If Wall Street had not shut down trading for the day on purpose to save these companies, they would have went out of business that day. That's how dependent they are on the government's money, the tax money, which is whose money? Our money. Our money to maintain a system of slavery and human traffic. So these things are easily found online. As abolitionists, you know, it, it, it's our, for me, let me speak for myself, as, as an abolitionist, I find it hard to see anything more important than the circumstance right now. And I say that in the same tenor and tone and, and feeling of, uh, of immediacy that my ancestors had, that Harry Tubman had, that uh, Lord William Lloyd Garrison had, that Frederick Douglass had, because we're facing the same exact damn thing on a scale that would make them blush. Because, you know, at the height of the ch uh, chattel slavery industry here in the United States when the Civil War began, uh, when it ended, I believe there was four million people that were released. Am I correct? It was like four million people that they said were emancipated now? Uh, emancipated now? Emancipated. Emancipated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they did, right? <laughs> but it was four million people. We have far more than four million people behind bars right now. Uh, there are, um, as I mentioned earlier, when we was talking about the other stuff, uh, at per year there are 120 million people that go through the jail system. Twelve, twelve million that go through the jail system per year. Uh, 670,000 go into the prison system per year, and uh, the for-profit private probation and the government probation companies and the parole uh, industries and also the bracelets that they use to let you out. That accounts for another 3 to 5 million. So <coughs> collectively, it's about 24 million people a year that are involved in the criminal justice system whether in the prisons or under observation because of the bracelets or whatever it is that they had. That's a lot of damn people. 24 million. Only 4 million were emancipated in, at the end of the Civil War. We're talking about 24 million every year here in this country. And we become so desensitized to it that we just don't give a damn anymore. Or even worse. Even worse. 
to support in, in so many different ways. None of us are free.